And please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Nancy Snow, Director of the Institute for the Study of Human Flourishing and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oklahoma, uh, whose talk is titled Compassion, Empathy, and Pro-Social Behavior. Thank you, and all of the people not speaking, mute your mic, please. Can't hear you. Go Michael. ahead when, when you're ready. Michael can't hear. No, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, well, first I'd like to thank Christopher for inviting me to participate in for organizing this conference. And I'd like to thank Michael Sloat for suggesting that I be invited and for graciously agreeing to comment on my remarks. Before I start, I just want to say the uh, uh, Darsha's last example uh, calls to mind my uh, experience as a schoolgirl in Catholic school. The playground that we had did not have a bark chip surface. It was asphalt, uh, which developed resilience, but also resulted in a lot of head injuries. So um, anything that I say, remember, that asphalt contacted my head at one point in time. <laughs> So uh, that's my disclaimer. But anyway, um, the, the actual title, I changed the title, and it's now Compassion, Empathy, and Pro-Social Behavior, colon, Degradation and Restoration. So I do have um, a bit of a, an introduction. I'm going to talk through some of it, but then I'm going to read some of it. Um, and the whole idea is that we do have capacities for compassion, sympathy, and empathy, uh, but that social forces can degrade them and make it difficult for us to behave or even feel the appropriate emotions. And so I'm going back uh, and, draw and drawing on some of my very early work on compassion. So in a paper I wrote in 1991, I defended the view that compassion is feeling sorry for another who is undergoing serious misfortune. And I distinguished compassion from sympathy which I believe is sorrow for another whose plight is not so bad. Now, um, I'm sure we'll have discussions about the definitions of these, of these constructs, but I wanted to sort of clarify where I'm coming from on this. I mean, it makes sense to feel compassion for someone whose spouse has died or who's lost their job. It doesn't make sense to feel compassion for someone who's suffering from uh, in, an inflamed and grown toenail. So this example that I use, I mean, so we're talking about serious misfortune as uh, appropriate for compassion. Sympathy may be something not so bad. Um, and, the, and I think that we can, what is crucial to compassion is identification with the other. And we can achieve identification with another through imaginative dwelling on her circumstances. Uh, Lawrence Blum has advocated that position. I advocate the position that there is a belief in shared vulnerability. Uh, and that belief gives rise to things, to a belief such as that could be me. Okay, I could be in that situation. I see that I am as vulnerable as the other. And that's the sort of mechanism by means of which I'm able to identify with the other. Um, so unlike compassion and sympathy, when we empathize, we feel with the other. We feel an emotion similar to what they're experiencing. So in a paper I wrote in 2000, I drew on the work of psychologist Martin Hoffman to examine numerous mechanisms and processes through which empathy or its precursors in infants and children can be produced. And uh, the ones that I talked about there were reactive crying, motor mimicry, affective synchrony, social referencing, and classical conditioning. So I wanna briefly explain each of these. Reactive crying, um, Reactive crying occurs because studies have shown that infants cry more vigorously in response to human as opposed to non-human cries, and that reactive crying does not merely imitate other sounds, but has its own affective component. Motor mimicry is the imitation of physical movements or facial expressions of another. It's believed that facial mimicry of another's expressions produces a subjective experience of the same type of emotion that's felt by another. Affective synchrony. So starting at about the age of two months, infants respond during shared play to the positive facial and verbal expressions of others with their own positive affective expressions. Social referencing occurs when children check their caregiver's facial expressions when confronted with unfamiliar scenes and thereby pick up their caregiver's affect. It's related to gaze tracking in which one person follows another's gaze to a shared visual reference point. Classical conditioning occurs when an empathizer initially observes physical cues of another's emotion and simultaneously experiences similar emotion. Eventually, cues from others become conditioned stimuli, 
that elicit similar affect in the empathizer. So more could be said about each of these phenomena, but suffice it to say that they rely heavily on an empathizer's receiving physical cues from a target. They do not wither away or change beyond recognition as children become adults, and they are not supplanted or replaced by more uh, cognitively sophisticated forms of empathizing. So in my opinion, and you know, I, I follow psychologists here, these continue into adulthood. We don't lose these as we, as we age. So three cognitively sophisticated forms of empathizing in addition to these, that, that these aren't cognitively sophisticated, but three uh, sophisticated forms that merit mention are simulation, imaginative projection, and observation and inference. So simulation is a view that's been advanced by Robert M. Gordon and Alvin I. Goldman. And it, according to this view, I empathize by bracketing my own beliefs and affect and simulating in myself uh, how I think you feel in your situation. Imaginative projection, Adam Smith held this view and he believes that I empathize by imagining how I would feel if I were in your situation. And then observation and inference. So you maintains that we empathize with others by observing their behavior and inferring that they're experiencing a certain type of affect. Our references to the inner states of others are legitimated by correlating our own similar behavior with the forms of affect that we experience. So if I mope when I'm sad and observe you moping, for example, I infer that you're sad. How this generates similar affect in me, however, is far from clear. Among other factors that contribute to empathy, you maintains or resemblance and physical contiguity. So I want to highlight uh, two things from this all too brief overview. The first is, as Hume resem realized, resemblance is crucial. Both em empathy and compassion are made possible by similarities between people and are heightened by the recognition of these similarities. Second, as I mentioned, the processes by which we develop our capacities for empathizing in infancy and childhood form the bases for com capacities for, ca for empathy that continue into adulthood. Because of this, I believe that we often empathize with others as parts of our social learning histories without having to get thought to what we're doing, right? So we sort of empathize naturally. We don't think about it. You know, we see another person in distress. We might uh, experience similar affect, but we have this sort of background history that becomes part of our non-conscious processing. And so we simply are able to do this without giving much thought to it, okay? However, that said, uh, social forces can be deliberately used to distort or undermine the capacities we develop from infancy and childhood, resulting in what I call degraded compassion and empathy. So I wanna give some examples now to turn to uh, the de degradations of compassion and empathy and possible causes. So for an article on Abu Ghraib that I wrote some time ago in 2009, I had occasion to delve into some of the extensive literature uh, about how seemingly ordinary people can produce atrocities or can commit atrocities, sorry. Much of this literature was produced in the wake of the Holocaust. And I found the work of Irvin Staub, a psychologist and Holocaust survivor, quite insightful. So Staub maintains that difficult life conditions can threaten psychological as well as physical well-being, and that powerful self-protective motives arise when people are faced with such threats. So he also contends that violent responses to such threats are made more likely by predisposing cultural factors, among which are tendencies to aggression, an authoritarian culture, and the presence of scapegoats. So Staub's remarks are suggestive of the kinds of social conditions that can degrade capacities for empathy and compassion and should strike a resonant chord given the present political situation in the United States. Many people, especially in rural areas, apparently felt disenfranchised and disrespected by the way the country was headed before 2016. Apparently they perceived their physical and psychological well-being to be threatened. Along came Trump, who in campaign rallies and subsequently introduced a new level of aggression and incivility into political rhetoric, making scapegoats of women, the disabled minorities and immigrants, and encourage, encouraging a culture of authoritarianism by claiming that he and he alone could solve the problems that beset the United States. So I'm not suggesting that Trump created these tendencies to aggression, authoritarianism, and scapegoating in people. 
What I am suggesting is that he identified the fear that certain groups of people felt in response to what they perceived as threats to their well-being, tapped into it, publicly legitimated existing sentiments of aggression, inclinations toward authoritarianism, and scapegoating, and whipped all this up into the frenzy that we see today. So, and to me, this situation provides an interesting initial glimpse into the kinds of psychosocial conditions that can degrade compassion and empathy. How likely is it that one can feel compassion and empathy for others if one believes that one is threatened and feels fear? How likely is it that pro-social behavior produced by compassion and empathy would override impulses to act self-protectively? I suppose the likelihood depends on how strong one's tendencies to compassion and empathy are, how intense one's fear is, and how dire one perceives the threat to oneself to be. Trump's rhetoric weighed in favor of the threat, fear, aggression side of the equation, while concomitantly degrading the compassion empathy side to one of softness and weakness. The message seemed to be that strong people, that is to say authoritarianism, protect themselves and their families from threats, i.e. aggression, by undeserving unwanted others, immigrants and others denigrated by Trump, whereas weak people, the compassionate and empathetic, allow themselves to be trodden upon and used to promote the interests of others. In such a climate, it seems that compassion and empathy for members of out-groups would be very difficult for members of alleged in-groups to sustain, though in-group members would have, the had, would have been the beneficiaries of self-serving and myopic compassion and empathy. Okay, and by in-group members here, I mean those who perceive these threats against themselves, out-group members, those who are perceived as threats to these folks. So in what sense would the compassion and empathy of in-group members for each other be self-serving and myopic? It would have these properties if A, it were premised on threats and grievances that were apparent rather than real, B, it perpetuated a false culture of victimhood among in-group members, C, it was exclusively reserved for in-group members, qua in-group members, and denied to out-group members. D, it relied upon falsehoods, misconceptions, and dehumanizations of out-group members. And E, the combination of these factors propagated an ideology of discrimination and hatred, privileging the interests of, and beliefs of in-group members at the expense of out-group members. So in the scenario thus understood, the compassion and empathy of in-group members is degraded in two respects. First, by being inhibited or truncated when directed toward out-group members, and second, by being ideologically biased when directed toward in-group members. Sadly, I don't think this is an uncommon phenomenon, nor do I think it can be attributed only to certain groups in the present-day United States. Similar psychosocial dynamics arose in pre-Nazi and Nazi Germany, and can now be seen in alt-right movements in a number of European countries, as well as among nat other nationalist groups, such as right-wing Hindutva in India, and Mabata, a Buddhist anti-Rohingya group in Myanmar. So this group, um, the Dalai Lama, or sorry, not the Dalai Lama, but the, but the Buddhist authorities in Myanmar uh, ordered them to stop, ordered them to dissolve, and they did dissolve under that name and immediately reformed under a different name. So let me now amplify the sketch I've given <clears throat> using Staub's insights with the work of social, psycho uh, social cognitive psychologist Albert Bandura on mechanisms of moral disengagement. As with Staub, Bandura seeks to explain how apparently ordinary people can come to commit atrocities. Mechanisms of moral disengagement are factors that blunt the force of internalized self-sanctions that could otherwise curtail aggression, such as the fear of punishment, moral principles, codes forbidding violence, and empathy. Mechanisms of moral disengagement focus on how perpetrators interpret their attitudes and actions and how these interpretations facilitate their abilities to inflict harm. Here we consider moral rationalizations, blaming the victim, and dehumanization. So I'm just gonna take a subset of what Bandura talks about. Okay. So moral rationalizations make destructive acts morally palatable by portraying them as being in the service of moral purposes. How might this work to curtail empathy? In my earlier paper on empathy, I described an example from Adam Smith in which we see someone being beaten. The recipient of the drubbing is angry, and in Smith's example, we empathize and become angry with him. Then we discover that his beating is just punishment for a crime he has committed. 
Smith thinks that our anger should dissipate, that our empathy for the criminal and the anger we had felt all along with him should be corrected by a moral norm, right? Now consider the following example. Suppose that I'm one of a group of people who are strongly opposed to immigration. I want Trump to build that wall. Yet, when presented with images of immigrant children being forcibly separated from their parents and held in cages, I feel compassion for the children and empathize with the parents. Then suppose I encounter rhetoric such as this. These people are breaking the law. The New Testament enjoins us not to break the law. Only Congress can change the situation. The president's policy is merely upholding the law. We need to stanch the flood of illegal immigrants who are taking away our jobs and other resources meant for bona fide citizens. What kind of parent would subject their children to this? And so on. These and similar messages are moral rationalizations. They are attempting to portray immigrant parents and children as morally in the wrong and thus is unworthy of our compassion and empathy. In the case presented by Smith, the presumption is that empathy was curtailed and corrected by the discovery of a fact invoking a legitimate moral norm. In the case of the immigrants, however, a faux moral purpose is being invoked for the separation and incarceration, that of lawfully protecting the country from an illegal threat. The immigrants and the children are placed in the wrong, as was the recipient of the beating in Smith's example. The overall message is that since they are in the wrong, we ought not to feel compassion and empathy for them. Unlike Smith's example, however, the moral purpose being used to rationalize the mistreatment of immigrants is a false one that ignores many relevant facts. For example, about the kinds of jobs that immigrants hold, many unwanted by US citizens, and about the kinds of detention that are lawfully available. Note too, too the slur on the parenthood of adult immigrants with children. What kind of parent would subject their children to this? This slur completely ignores the dreadful situations, some involving threats to children, that immigrant families seek to escape, and the historical role of the United States in creating conditions that brought those situations about. In other words, the moral rationalizations, and this and other kinds of cases, do not invoke legitimate moral purposes and do not objectively take into account the complex array of facts that bear on moral judgments in such cases. Yet moral rationalizations are being used to suppress compassion and empathy in cases in which those qualities are sorely needed. We also see blaming the victim at work in the example of the immigrant parents, sorry, immigrant par parents and children. Blaming the victim is blatantly obvious in the slur on parents. These people choose to put their children in jeopardy and so are not worthy of compassion and empathy. Blaming the victim allows us to rationalize our mistreatment of them, to distance ourselves from them. We are not like them. We are good parents who would never do such a thing. This distancing prevents us from compassionate identification with the other, from having the thought, that could be me, which I earlier claimed is one mechanism through which we're able to identify with and be compassionately moved by the plight of another. It also prevents us from engaging in cognitively sophisticated forms of empathy, as when we seek to enter more fully into the experiences of another by imaginatively projecting ourselves into her circumstances or by simulating in our minds what we think she might be going through. Finally, the dehumanization of hated and feared others has long been with us. As I note in my discussion of Abu Ghraib, and I'm quoting for myself here, dehumanized victims are no longer viewed as persons, but as subhuman gooks, savages, towel heads, and so on, end quote. Trump, for example, has called Mexicans rapists and murderers, and undocumented, undocumented immigrants, animals. Epsom Furman discussed the alien other, a culture of dehumanizing immigrants in the United States. In an interesting article in the Boston Globe, Brodeur discusses the culture of euphemism in the United States and how it can block empathy by using terms such as fences instead of cages, tent cities instead of camps, and blankets instead of sheets of foil. In an insightful letter commenting on Brodeur's piece, Sarah Coletti makes the following points worth reproducing in full, and here I quote, Michael Andor Brodeur's at-large column in the Sunday art section, and it was entitled United States of Euphemism, makes an important point. I have been noting for months, maybe years, the dehumanizing language being used to describe every topic in the immigration debate. I am disturbed when these terms are adopted by the media. Family unification policy, 
became chain migration. Catch and release is a phrase that I have always heard used about fishing. To hear it referring to people is appalling. Putting a so-called in front of it or adding quotes does not make it any more acceptable. These phrases completely remove the human being from the sentence. As a mother of a person with disabilities, I'm aware of the movement toward people first language. Learning to construct sentences thoughtfully and guard against reductionist language changes more than the conversation. It affects our viewpoint, improves our vision, end quote. Ms. Coletti aptly notes how language affects our viewpoint and our vision, but our vision, how we perceive others, influences the feelings we have for them. The kind of language used in the immigration debate and other contexts to dehumanize and denigrate others degrades compassion and empathy. I believe that the continued use of such language can have permanent effects on our capacities, truncating and distorting them to fit fear and hate-filled ideologies. Can we combat these trends? In the final section of these, this presentation, I suggest possible solutions and resources. So the next, pres the next part is called Restoring Compassion and Empathy, Possible Ways Forward. And here I just wanna warn you that this needs a lot of work. I mean, this, this is the tough part. It's where the rubber hits the road. It just needs a lot of, a lot more thought. So how might we combat the degradation of compassion and empathy? Ms. Coletti mentions people first language. According to that fountain of knowledge, Wikipedia, okay, and so I'm gonna quote from that great fountain of knowledge, okay, people first language, PFL, uh, also called person first language, is a type of linguistic prescription to avoid marginalization or dehumanization, either conscious or subconscious, when discussing people with a health issue or disability, end quote. So instead of referring to the stutterer, for example, people first language enjoins us to say those who stutter. Similarly, instead of saying the alcoholic or the addict, it's better to say the person suffering from alcoholism or the person battling addiction. Extending these linguistic prescriptions to other groups can serve as reminders that immigrants, Muslims, Jews, Hispanics, gays, lesbians, etc., are not just members of groups that are stigmatized or looked down upon by some people, but are people in their own right, worthy of equal concern and respect. Linguistic prescriptions alone, of course, will not be enough. In a recent opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal provocatively entitled, There's Too Much Virtue in Politics, okay, Joseph Epstein offers another piece of advice, meet people in the flesh. Once we actually meet other people, he contends, they are harder to caricature. He makes this point by way of a discussion of a 1938 letter from George Orwell to the poet Stephen Spender, in which Orwell registers regret at having met Spender. Okay, so Epstein writes, and here's, I'm going to quote from this because this, this I thought was a very, I, I see a Christopher, I'm on it. Okay, this is a very, a good quote. Before their encounter, Orwell reports, he had disdained Spender as a parlor bullshit because A, your verse, when I had read what I had read of it, did not mean very much to me. B, I looked upon you as a sort of fashionable, successful person, also a communist or communist sympathizer. And I have been very hostile to the Communist Party since about 1935. And C, because not having met you, I could regard you as a type and an, abst an abstraction. Orwell adds that when you meet anyone in the flesh, you realize immediately that he is a human being and not a sort of caricature embodying certain ideas. As a result, and this is Orwell, I shall never again be able to show any intellectual brutality towards him, even when I feel that I ought to, end quote. Partly for this reason, Orwell avers, quote, I don't mix much in literary circles, end quote. So meeting people in the flesh, it seems, is one way to counter the kinds of bias and prejudice that block compassion and empathy. But Orwell himself identifies a pitfall. Prejudiced people actively avoid physical encounters with those whom they dislike. We can add that if they do meet them, they are often so close-minded that they cut themselves off from the receptivity to others needed for compassion and empathy. How can we cultivate the kind of open-mindedness that would allow people to see the common humanity of others and foster their, capac the, their capacities for compassion and empathy? Education is one answer, but so too is encouraging shared activities. So some shared activities can break down barriers. And I, I'm gonna give you one example, and that is, uh, it's controversial, of course, but what I've seen happen is when people of different races and ethnicities come together to watch their kids play sports, they can really unify.
Now, the, the evident counterexample is the soccer games that erupt in violence and sort of and things like that. But having having recently attended a number of middle school basketball games involving a number of uh, parents and children of different ethnicities, there's there's quite a camaraderie that can develop in the stands. And this is the kind of thing that I think could very well help to combat some of this high level pressure, this high level rhetoric that we are seeing in our country today, that you know, at the grassroots level in activities which appeal to the commonality of our shared interests and our de deeper nature, raising children, having homes, creating family life, the things that really matter to us, maybe we can find ways of uh, overcoming some of the, the present divisiveness that we see in our country today. Anyway, I'm saying we can hope. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our first uh, question will be a keynote. Uh, uh, people can speak up or, or you can call on people, uh, anyone. Uh, did you just introduce me or not? He's, he said he's opening the floor, yeah, but, right. I think, but I think Michael volunteered to, to make commentary on my remarks. Yeah, let me do that. Oh, um, sorry. Yes, uh, please. Okay, may I go? Yeah. yeah okay. So um, I'm not going to discuss Nancy's really very insightful discussion of the degradation of empathy in modern circumstances and about how you might restore it or remedy it. I'm going to really concentrate on some technical issues uh, where I think some clarification is needed. Yeah. I'm not necessarily going to correct uh, anything that she, she has said or that she may believe, uh, but I do uh, want to make some connections that she doesn't make. So first about Hume. Uh, Nancy, you talked about uh, the, the kind of inference to what others are thinking or feeling that Hume talks about. But you know, the most distinctive thing that Hume says about empathy uh, is that it works by a kind of contagion. Mm -hmm. All right. So that you didn't mention, and I think I should actually mention it. Thank In you. other words, Hume says that the attitudes uh, and feelings of others tend to infuse themselves into us, uh, especially when we're, we're close to us, either personally or, or, or in physical distance. Uh, and he also says that the feelings of one person tend by, uh, by a kind of contagion to spread to others. So this is a very distinctive part of Hume's theory that you didn't mention, uh, though what you did mention uh, was not inaccurate. So I'm, when I talk about empathy, I'm, I'm mostly thinking about the kind of empathy uh, mm -hmm. by contagion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, or kind of receptive of the feelings of others uh, that Hume was the first really to pioneer in any kind of systematic way. Now, this then leads to uh, what you said about uh, compassion and sympathy on the one hand and empathy on the other. You contrasted them. Uh, and let me just leave sympathy out of the picture. Uh, although you didn't say it, the way you contrasted them could lead some listeners or readers or whatever to think that compassion and empathy are separate phenomena. And I think that would be a mistake. If someone helps another person because it's, they think it's their duty to help the sufferer, right? Uh, that's not compassion, okay? Mm -hmm. Moreover, if they, or in the different case, if they help somebody who's suffering because they think that makes the world a better place, again, that's not compassion. It seems to me that for something legitimately to be called compassion in our ordinary sense of the term, there has to be empathy. There has to be some kind of emotional connection. So empathy and, uh, and, and, and compassion are more closely connected than you suggested. Now, the other side of the coin, and this is much more controversial, is in my opinion that in situations where there's suffering and distress, empathy entails compassion. Now, the standard psychological literature doesn't doesn't believe that. They think it's a kind of contingent and almost a miraculous matter that empathy should lead to compassionate and altruistic behavior. But I think, in fact, the connection is much tighter. So let me just briefly say why I think that. Empathy t tends, to tends to involve uh, feeling what the other feels and also in regard to what they're feeling it about. In other words, with regard to the object uh, of, of their feeling. So if a father uh, you know, is, is infected by his daughter's enthusiasm for stamp collecting. He doesn't just feel uh, you know, free floating enthusiasm, it's enthusiasm for stamp collecting, okay? 
Now, similarly, if somebody is suffering and in distress uh, at the pain, let's say, the, the, the immense pain in their arm, it seems to me that, uh, that, that when we take in that pain empathically, what we take in is not just the pain, but its internal, or, uh, or its internal object. So if somebody is suffering, uh, uh, and, and, and suffering and in distress about the pain in their arm, if I, sympath if I empathize with them, if I identify with them, I feel distress at that pain too. Well, distress by, very, by its very definition involves motivation to alleviate. So what I'm saying is if you really do empathize with someone's distress at the pain in their arm, by definition, okay, you are distressed by that pain and you want to do something to alleviate it. So the compassion follows immediately immediately out of, uh, out of the empathy. So I think the connection between empathy and compassion is actually much tighter than the literature suggests. You didn't deny that, but I thought I'd amplify. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. That's, uh, your comments are instructive and insightful as always. Let me just briefly comment, if I may, on your points about Hume's views on contagion, which are extremely important, I think, uh, that they really provide a missing link for me in my thinking about de the degradation and restoration issue. Uh, the kind of restoration that I had in mind when I described my experience of um, being among middle school parents of different ethnicities watching their children play, I think emotional contagion, the contagion good. is good. exactly what is going on in that situation. Good. Very and good. it's highly restorative. So thank you again good. for those comments. If I could follow up on the second thing that Michael said. Who's uh, talking? It's oh, Michael Fraser. Yeah. Hi. I guess you're just um, going to have to jump in here. This is a highly competitive field. <laughs> I'm sorry if there's someone else who was No, Michael, go ahead. I think Gus will unmute eventually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, w I was, I guess this is more of a disagreement with Michael than with, with, with you, but I think uh, the desire to alleviate can take two different forms, right? One way to end my empathetic suffering is by helping end the suffering of the person I'm empathizing with, and that could be compassionate or pro-social behavior. But the other way would be by withdrawing from the situation, by cultivating in that way that, you know, Goebbels encouraged uh, concentration camp commanders to cultivate their strength of soul, to not feel empathetic suffering anymore. So if, if the goal is simply to alleviate, then, empathy could lead to compassion, or it could lead to other ways of alleviating one's own empathetic suffering that do nothing to alleviate the suffering. May um, I respond to that? Yes. May I respond to that? I think you've misunderstood the situation, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, when I said that the person <clears throat> empathizes with the other person's the desire to alleviate their pain, what that means is that the person shares the desire to alleviate that pain. This is not a desire to alleviate their own empathic response. It's a desire wow. to alleviate the, the pain of the other person. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it entails compassion. Mm -hmm. Can I say something here? Hi. <laughs> Gus, do you want to let Carol move ahead of you or what? I was actually, actually my, my point was very much um, in line with what Michael just said. So uh -huh. I, I was just going to bring up some of the distinctions that are made in the social psychological literature in terms of the different kinds of responses to alleviate the stress and, and just point out that, but, but then again, Mike, Michael corrected or sort of clarified what he meant by, uh, by that compassion. So it's, it's fine. I'm okay. Okay, okay. good. Thank okay. you, Gus. Okay. Carol, would you like to proceed? It's been a long time since I wrote my master's thesis on empathy. Uh, I was basing my uh, conclusions on the work of Edmund Husserl and Edith Stein. I came to the conclusion in my work that empathy can be used just as easily for evil as it can be used for good. And I take issue with those who are equating empathy with some... Uh, compassionate, altruistic, loving, generous, uh, nurturing response. It isn't. Empathy in itself is entirely neutral. Uh, and I do see it as a wonderful human 
capacity involving both affect, as Dr. Narvaz explains so beautifully and how that is fostered in early childhood, with our amazing powers of cognition, as Dr. Snow was so beautifully describing uh, in the ways we infer and we project and we understand and we uh, logically conclude that the other is like me and therefore may very well be going through exactly what I went through in that circumstance. So that empathy becomes a blending or a synthesis of affect and cognition and it can be used just as easily for evil. The sadist is probably the most empathic actor you can imagine. His entire delight comes from knowing precisely how to hurt the other and exactly how it feels. So uh, I, I want to take issue and, and be sure that we differentiate between compassion and empathy. I would... If Dr. Narvez is still there, I, I'm wondering how she views cognition, the role of cognition in the evolution and development of empathy. She seems to have a rather narrow focus on it being only affective. And uh, if any of you have any insights, she's given a great case for how we can foster affective empathy in children, but how can we foster uh, the logical recognition in myself that you are seeing what you are seeing and how that can strengthen our ability to respond to one another? Well, it looks like Darsha is still here. I think you need to unmute. Darsha, can you unmute Julie? Well, maybe Nancy, you should say something and maybe I can say something after you if, uh, if, 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 if there's time. I think Darsha needs to unmute before she can say anything, but certainly Michael, go, go ahead. Oh, well. Uh, yes, in response to Carol, uh, the example of the sadist who is very empathic, this trades on an ambiguity uh, that is well known in the field of, of discussions of empathy. There's projective empathy where you get into the head of the other. And this is something that the sadist can do. They can really get into the head and they know exactly how to torture their victim or how their victim is vulnerable. But there's another kind of empathy, not going into the other, but rather feeling what they feel. And it's often said that the sadist can't feel, or the psychopath can't feel what the other feels, okay? So that's the kind of empathy I've been stressing and, 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 and focusing on. When I talked about the example uh, of the person who has empathy for the, uh, the, 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 the suffering of the other, I meant the second kind of empathy. That's the kind of empathy I think entails compassion. I, I'm on my computer now. Oh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the computer wouldn't unmute for a while. Uh, yeah, I, it's cognition and emotion developed together. So I, I was emphasizing mostly the emotion because that's more of what empathy is usually considered uh, in psychology and elsewhere. So, but everything uh, is uh, connected and combined in attachment kind of development and so on. So I think the thing about personal distress is that um, uh, you can go either way. You can either... Um, be uh, increase in compassion, want to help the person, if you're able to self-regulate your own kind of stress reaction. But if you can't, you're going to turn away. And we know that from the, the research. So it, it, again, matters on your self-regulation how empathic you can be. Thank you. Okay, final comment, uh, Nancy. 
I, I really have nothing further to say except many thanks for everyone for their wonderful questions, especially to Michael for your uh, tremendous insights into uh, into this uh, work and uh, especially for for putting me on to Yum and Contagion. That's very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for their questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Thanks to all. Uh, let's give a hand and... Uh, uh,